morning, church family. It's great to see you. Thanks for coming out. I'm so excited that we're together today, and I know God's going to do incredible things. If everybody could, take your card that's right in front of you. Fill that out. Uh, those of you on our campus, 415 North Main Street, welcome. Those of you who are watching online, thank you so much for joining us. If you're on our campus, take your card and fill that fill that out. It's a great way for us to stay connected. If you're a first-time guest, welcome. We're so glad that you've come today. Hope that you will be encouraged in your walk with the Lord. And if you're a first-time guest, take that card, and when the service is over, stop by starting point out in the four-year atrium area. We have a gift we'd like to give you just to say thanks for coming. There are some phenomenal things going on in the life of the church family. Great events, great activities, incredible ministries, and we want you to know about everything that's going on. Make sure you go to the church website, the church app. You will see everything. We talk about a few of those during our time of worship, but we can't mention all of them. So make sure you go to the church website and you will see everything that's going on. Uh, the psalmist wrote, I will exalt you, my God, the King, every day. Every day I will lift my voice and worship you. For great is the Lord and worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. We come today to lift our voices and to be, be a choir that offers our worship to the one who is worthy of it. Let's stand as we sing over a thousand tongues.
and praise or praise will ever be on our lips let's continue as we praise our father
And it's easy to do when we're surrounded by a bunch of friends who are all just holding on to the rugged cross. But it's much harder to do when we're out among those that are militant against who you are and are influenced by that. So like your apostle from long ago, Paul, wrote to the church at Ephesus, he said, pray for me that I may declare the gospel boldly. So we're asking you right now to empower us with clarity and the words to declare the goodness that you are, the holiness that you are, the ultimate purpose for our lives that you have planned for each of us. And we pray that we can do this boldly in this community so that you are glorified by who we are. Father, we gather here because we love you, we love each other, and we love Jesus. We gather here because we need to lean into one another. And we lean into one another because of the power that you give us through your spirit. So be with us in Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. Ah, oh, so good to see your beautiful faces today. And even though some of you may not have a beautiful face, we're glad you're here too. Glad you're here too. You know who you are. It's all right. We take everybody here. We take everybody here. All right. Let me get the elephant out of the room. And I'm not referring to my weight. Let me get the elephant out of the room. We are reconstructing our sound booth, as you can see. We have for years felt we weren't able to control the sound effectively when it's 7,000 feet in the air. Plus, we got 900 technicians running all up and down, and people on the balcony are like, it's hard to concentrate. And so we're, we're moving it down here so we can better control the sound and the environment. Problem is, we're going to lose some seating, and that stinks because you look around, and we don't have much room to lose. So we're going to start stacking chairs on top of each other. <laughs> so you want to get here early because you don't want to be on the bottom. So we're going to work through that best we can. But please understand, this was not an easy decision. And, and, and we knew some things were going to happen that we didn't like. Uh, but I have a, I have a, a statement I, I, I use in the staff meeting uh, frequently. I said, it, it goes like this. Every time you swat and kill a fly, five frogs go hungry that night. So every time you fix something and you think you've done a great job, you got four other challenges that you got to overcome. But please just be patient with us. I think once we get it done and fixed and it's going to be beautiful, uh, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. All right. So last week I, I piggybacked off a phrase that, I, uh, that we all saw in the Super Bowl, but it's really just weighed heavy on me. And it was the, the 32nd commercial entitled He Gets Us. And, and I said last week, I'm going to repeat it. I, I think the crux of that statement speaks to me personally. I got to tell you something, friends. I don't want to serve a Jesus that doesn't have a clue to what I go through. Do you? All right. That's why the Greeks were so frustrated with those false gods. They didn't have a clue. They, they were, first of all, they, they were figments of one's imagination. They were false gods. They were idols. And God reminds the children of Israel all the time. You, you see these pagan cultures. They, they create these false gods made out of clay and wood and stubble. And, and yet you serve the God, the sovereign one, the I am, the creator. And that's who we serve today. But, but, I know I, I personally 
I personally, as I travel this road in my faith, I need to be able to talk to God openly and honestly about what I'm going through. And I need a God who can look back at me and say, Jim, I sent my son so that he could experience that as well. So I get you. Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You don't serve a God who fails to understand and sympathize and empathize with our weaknesses. So he was tempted at all points as we, but was without sin. So when I say to God, God, you know what I'm going through. God's like, my son does. Remember, 33 years, he camped out with you people. He ate with you. He went shopping in Jerusalem. He sat in traffic and never uttered a foul word. (laughs) So that takes the excuse away from all of us. He was tempted like me. He gets our weakness. But in the same token, I I also know that the, the, the pending question today for me also is, and for all of us, is do we get God? Do we get God? When Jesus saved the woman caught in adultery, And he said to those who were getting ready to hurl stones at her, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. And he looks at her and says, neither do I. She's like, thank you for getting me. And she's like, oh, that's good. I want you to know I get you. But he said something else to her that put the weight of responsibility on change for her. He says, I need you to stop sinning. So this is a two-way street. I don't think you can have one phrase and not the other. I don't think you can use the term, do you get God, without understanding that he gets us. But I think we make a fatal mistake in contemporary culture if all we do is land on the he gets us, he gets us. Because there's a, there's a little bit of, of philosophy or there's a theory that goes into that statement that almost suggests that he gets us, period, and he gets us irregardless of any change on our part. And I think for me to really appreciate the fact that he gets me is that I have to get him. How many times you've coached someone in a marriage crisis and, and, the, and the spouse says to the other, she just doesn't understand me. Okay, well, it's important that she understand you, but do you understand her? Merle Unger speaks of the characteristics of Christ. Now, so what I want to do is this. I want us, because I, I'm like, well, do you get Jesus? Do you get Jesus? I'm like, yes, I get Jesus. What does that mean? What is, do I get him just as a historical figure? Do I get him as a person who lived uh, in the first century and taught people how to be better behaved and, and practiced a lot of social justice? And so is that all that I need to get when I say I get Jesus? Or, or, Does the Bible state emphatically getting Jesus means his teachings, his worldview literally becomes the model for me as a person on planet earth. And I think that's what it means. I think getting Jesus means I incorporate the characteristics of Jesus in my everyday life. So we had an elders retreat Friday and Saturday And um, one of our elders just kept driving this point home. He says, you know, we can have a lot of effective programs and and we can help direct people to to understand and, and appreciate God more. But at some point, we just have to keep reminding people it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about living like Jesus and talking like Jesus and 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 contemplating life choices like Jesus would would contemplate. Do you know that 700 years before Jesus got here? The prophet Isaiah says to us, this is the characteristics of Jesus. This is what the Messiah is going to look like and talk like and be like. This is the stamp he's going to place on planet earth. Isaiah, the 11th chapter. First of all, we know that the rod will come from the stem of Jesse. That is, the Messiah will come from the lineage of Jesse. And Jesse's son was David. And you know how that played out. A branch shall grow out of its roots. And we all know that the, the, the root was, was going to grow out of a dead stump. Israel is a nation's dead. It's dead. Assyria just demolished it in 722. Judah fell in 586 to the Babylonians. There is no real Jewish nation anymore. But out of this dead stump is going to come this little, this little stem. It's like you have to really look for it. What, what is this? Ooh, that's the Messiah growing out of this dead culture we call Israel. This spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, The characteristics of the Messiah will be a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now get this. The Messiah, Isaiah prophesies in verse 3, will delight in the fear of the Lord and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. That means he will be just. He will not favor people because they're rich. 
He will not favor people because they're white or black or Hispanic. He will not favor people because they're highly educated or horribly undereducated. He's going to judge fairly. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but rather with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. In other words, truth will be his guide. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness, verse 5, will be the belt of his loins. That will be the standard that he uses when he teaches and preaches. Righteousness and faithfulness, the belt around his waist. This is, these are the characteristics of the Messiah. These are the characteristics we're going to discuss over the next few weeks. Here's the first characteristic that I want us to discuss today. So Jesus gets me, excellent. Isaiah, the 11th chapter, tells me he gets me. But now I have a responsibility to get him. And if I'm going to get him, I have to understand what made Jesus tick, what made him act the way he did. Now, look, good news is we don't have to sit around and, dis- and, and discuss like the secular world does every Christmas. I wonder what color Jesus was. Ugh. Don't you just want to go, who cares? Who cares? Right? Who cares? There was a discussion all on social media last week. What was his accent? Who cares? Right? Why do we, that's, that's the devil. And see, the devil loves to get those conversations going. Because all these theologians are running around going, oh, let's see here. This is what he looks like right here, Isaiah, the 11th chapter. This is what he looks like. You want to look, you want to know what Jesus looks like? Right here. This helps us know what he looks like. This is, if you want to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, be like Jesus, right here. All right. Merrill Unger writes, quote, justice. That's the, that's the point we want to drive home today. If Jesus is just, if God is just, then I want to be a person who practices justice. If this is one of the characteristics of Jesus, and if I want to get him, then i got to get him in a totality. So that the characteristic today is justice. Merle Unger says, the quote, the justice of righteousness of God is proclaimed emphatically in the Scriptures. Both Old and New Testaments speak as God being just. Constantly throughout Scripture, we see the holiness and divine justice administered to people. So God administered it through Jesus, and then Jesus taught us, his people, how to administrate it. His laws are equitable and practical. He is known as the righteous governor and judge of the entire world. In Isaiah, the 58th chapter, Isaiah, the 58th chapter, verse 6 through 11, Isaiah writes, Is this not the fast that I have chosen now? The children of Israel had implemented a very um, um, hypocritical way of fasting. In other words, they were fasting, but their lifestyle, their choices, their religion was void of any truth. So hypocrisy had to be dealt with. So God says, that's not the fast I want. This is the fast that I have chosen. I want to lose the bonds of the wickedness. I want to undo the heavy burdens I want to undo the heavy burdens to let the oppressed go free and that you may break every yoke. It is not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. And when you see a person who is naked, cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Then you will say in a dark world, this is what justice looks like. Boy, we hear a lot about social justice, right? Social justice, which, which has, been so def- has been defined in so many different ways. Unfortunately, social justice now is mostly defined as virtue signaling. I hate to break the news, but it is. But God commands us to be just. He commands us to be fair to the person who's naked clothing, the person who's hungry, feed him. The person who's destitute, reach down and help him up. This is what justice looks like according to God. So if God says, I'm going to send my son, and these are the qualities of Christ, 
These are the qualities that I want to have in mind. I want to be that kind of person too. But I need someone other than the federal government or the welfare programs in America to set the tone for justice. I don't need the Department of Justice. I don't need the CIA or the Federal Bureau of Investigation to now tell me what is justice because they haven't discovered it for the most part. But there is one who does, and that is God. And he transformed that message through his son, and he's given us the opportunity to mirror that and replicate those characteristics in our lives. Is what sets the church apart. It's what gives us our identity, social justice. But you can't have social justice without social order. And I've said this a thousand times. We've got people visiting. Every time a judge walks in a courtroom, people will be chattering. Attorneys will be making last-minute conversations with their, their client. And then the bailiff walks in, and the first thing he says is, all rise, order in the court. The reason why he says order in the court is so that the judge and the jury can judge and cast a verdict that is fair and honest. They can't have all kinds of distractions. Listen, the United States of America needs social justice, but social justice without social order coming from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will never happen. Let's get social order, and then let's talk about social justice. Verse 9, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. Dr. Smith says in his commentary on the book of Isaiah, social injustice was brought about by a rampant amount of sin. So God sends a message that he's ready to intervene. I'm going to intervene here in Israel. And he's telling us, I'm going to intervene in the United States of America. I'm going to intervene in Kissimmee, Florida. I'm going to intervene in South Orlando. And I'm going to use my tool, the church, the called out, the ecclesia to do it. And when we find out what justice looks like and we're ready to mirror it, Verse 9, the prophet says, call on the name of the Lord, and he will answer. Amen? And we have, God's just waiting by the phone. He's ready to answer, but we have to call upon him. You shall cry, and he will say what? I'm here. I get you. I'm here. Now, if you'll take away my yoke from my midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wicked, wickedness. If you'll extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. That's the worldview that I want to embrace. That's the worldview that the world needs but doesn't know it needs until the church says, hey, it's not just enough to know that he gets us, but are you ready to get him? And when you say, Jim, I'm ready to get God. And I'm ready to practice this kind of justice and this kind of love and this kind of attitude. Listen, God says, when you're ready to do it, you're ready to take this characteristic of justice and you're ready to let it play out in your life. He says, I will bless you. I will give you opportunities which you can't even imagine. Micah 6, 8, the prophet says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We see today the farther society drifts from responsible leadership outlined by the supreme being God, the more injustice we will see take place. Joseph Stowell in his book, Eternity, he writes, pimps and pornographers brutalize the weak and vulnerable in the midst of their own, for their own gain. Oppressive government pits the proletariat against the wealthy and plunder both. When Jesus cleansed the temple in Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 15 through 17, he recognized justice needed to prevail in the house of God. He was essentially saying to the world, I will not allow people to be abused because they hold power. The offense was that the money changers and those who marketed sacrifices were charging exorbitant rates to help the pilgrims who had no choice but to buy the sacrifices in the temple. And the Lord practiced justice, and he cleansed the temple of that unrighteousness. Throughout Scripture, Jesus is always standing up for those who have been abused by the powerful, those who had taken their leadership role and used it as a billy club against those who were less fortunate. That's why when Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the meek, 
Blessed are those who are meek. Those who have the ability to abuse people because of their power. Blessed are those who are meek who have the ability to beat people down. But because they're governed by Jesus Christ, they don't. Meek is not weak. It's controlled energy. It's controlled power. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. It's because of this injustice that God sent Jesus to rectify what we simply could not do as a race of people on our own. God says, you'll never understand justice until I send my son. But when I send Jesus, I will give you the truest, most comprehensive definition of justice. It's been said that justice and grace came together at the foot of the cross. Justice and unmerited favor came together at the foot of the cross. So what's the meaning of justification? Well, to justify does not mean to make righteous, but rather declare righteous. You say, well, that sounds confusing. Well, let Romans 4, 7, and 8 clarify that for us. Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 7 and 8, we see how God's justice was played out through the Messiah's life, death, and resurrection. Romans 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul actually quotes from David in Psalm 33, 1 through 2. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Now the word blessed here in the Greek means favored. Favored are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Now the Greeks thought of the word uh, of, of favored here uh, in the same way as, as we would felicity as this. As we've reached the absolute pinnacle of human success. Now remember, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, started off the Beatitudes with the word blessed. Blessed, which means happy or again favored. The Greeks all believed that the search and the goal for humanity was to find happiness. And so the Greeks had taught for years and years and years the quest for every human being is happiness, favor, euphoria. And they defined that in four areas. Wealth, And if you have a lot of money, then you have a lot of friends. If you have a lot of friends, then you have a lot of power. And if you have a lot of power, you have a lot of influence. So those were the four meal tickets to success in the minds of the Greek philosophers. Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I would like to talk about happiness. I would like to talk about fulfillment. And the people in the Sea of Galilee said, finally, we're going to hear some more messages on happiness. And Jesus said, blessed are those who what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. What about power? What about money? What about prestige? (laughs) Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. They were hearing a message they had never heard before. And that's why Jesus turned contemporary culture on its head. Church, we can do the same thing in 2024. We can. But we all have to come in this game together. And we all have to look at Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, if you did it, how can I take those same characteristics, model them in my life? The meaning of justification. Ooh, Hmm. I got to do this again in 30 minutes. (laughs) Slow down, Jim. You're going to die right here on the stage. The best way to define the righteous or the justice of Christ is to see him taking the penalty for us on the cross. By no means by doing that, he claimed us innocent. Folks, please understand that. When he went to the cross, it wasn't because now I'm innocent. Uh Uh-uh. It simply means even though guilty, I've been set free. Man, isn't that powerful? I mean, think about that. Think about the fact that God looks at me and goes, you're a wretched mess, Jim. Yes. You're hopeless. Yes. You're destined to hell. I know. But guess what, Jim? I'm going to set you free anyway. Give God a hand, baby. That's huge. (laughs) Romans 4, 5. Romans 4, 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. The man who does not look at his works as a road to justification will be saved. Now, are, is there such a thing as works of righteousness? Yeah, I mean, I have, to, I have to accept the grace, favor that I don't deserve but get. By faith, I receive that. But once I've absorbed the grace of Jesus, favor I got, I don't deserve. Declared innocent, even though guilty. Now it's essential that I become obedient to the word. 
obedient to the word. Jack Cottrell says, quote, even though we are guilty, God the judge treats us as if we were not guilty. Now, now, listen carefully. No sentence is pronounced against us. We are free from the penalty, the punishment, the condemnation, and the wrath. You say, that sounds too good to be true, Jim. Well, let all men be liars, but God be true. Romans 8.1, there is therefore no condemnation but only for those who are in Christ Jesus. We make a huge mistake when the church of Christ wants to become so comprehensive and so seeker sensitive that we implore people to follow Christ because there's no condemnation and fail to tell them that condemnation is only those who live for Jesus. Listen, if we have unsafe friends at work we have unsaved next-door neighbors that we watch football games with and we barbecue with. Please note that they are condemned to hell if they don't know Jesus, which means that there needs to be a conversation about the grace and the justice of Jesus Christ next time you get together. Wow. A lot riding on that conversation. But do you want your friends and your family members to be condemned to hell because we failed to share with them the grace and the justice of Jesus Christ, God forbid. So we understand that the meaning of justification is seen in grace and the cross, but there's a basis for justification as well. Basis for justification. So when a judge pronounces someone not guilty, on what basis does he reach that decision? That's a good question. Not guilty. Who? Well, judge, how'd you come up with that? Well, one possible basis for such a decision is that the person may actually be innocent. Now, if you watch those crime shows, 48 hours, ain't nobody innocent. I don't know how they're going to catch him, but he's dead. That's all I can say. And uh, <laughs> I hate to say this, but it seems like every, every, am I the only, has anybody ever watched 48 hours? Okay. All right. Three of you. That's good. All right. <laughs> I, knew that, I knew that point was going to die uh, right off the launching pad. Anyway, you know, if you watch that show long enough, you think that every marriage ends in death, right? It's sad, but wow, man. One possible basis for a decision of a, of a person being pronounced innocent by a judge is the fact that he may very well be innocent. Yeah. No crime, no punishment. All is cool. This is one way a person could indeed be justified before God by law or works of the law if he had kept them 100%. So Paul says, you know what? Jim, you may actually be pronounced innocent by God. All oh, right, except that you have to keep 100% of the law and never, ever, ever sin. Well, that ain't going to happen. All right, so then we can take that off the, that off the tray. That ain't going to happen. So let's take that argument away because we've all sinned in what? Fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Every one of us. So there's no way God's going to look at me and go, you know what, Jim, you don't need Jesus. Thank you because you have lived a completely innocent life. You've never sinned said no one okay so all right so what does Romans 3 19 and 20 tell us well let's take a look Romans 3 19 and 20 now we know that whatever the law and I, I think the law is more than just the the mosaic law I think it's the old testament I think it's the old testament whatever the old testament including the mosaic law says it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Now the world speaks of Jews and Gentiles. Now notice the phraseology here. That we may become guilty before God. So there is no one that's going to be pronounced not guilty. Because we're all guilty. We've all sinned. Look at verse 20. Therefore. The word therefore means hang on. Hang on. Good news is coming. Therefore. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. The word justified means even though guilty, pronounced innocent. But the guilt's still there. Still got to do something with that sin. That guilt's just not going to evaporate. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh, no person will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, the law reminds me every day and reminded the people in the Old Testament days and the days before Christ died and rose again. It just reminded them how pathetic they were with no remedy. You know, when you, 
are suffering financially, and you go to a, a, the bank and you say, hey, man, I got problems. They're like, ooh, you do. You want them to develop a plan for you, not just the banker sit there and go, yeah, you're dead. I know that. Is there a, is there a plan? No, no. But I will remind you every week of how pathetic you are and how financially destitute you are. Now, you may leave and wait for my call. <sighs> See, that's what the old law did. These people would take these animal sacrifices, stand before the priest, and the priest would pat them on the back as they were leaving and go, too bad, you're still a loser. I know, I know. Next year, Passover, don't forget, losers, I'll see you next year. I know. There they go, back to their tent. And then came Jesus and said, I'm going to do something you've never seen done before. I'm going to actually, for the first time in the history of humanity, because I'm a just Savior and because my God's a just judge, I'm going to stop reminding you of the knowledge of your sin and I'm going to actually forgive you of those sins. Amen? That's huge. That's huge. Sin is missing the mark. It's eclipsing the glory of God in your life. And I just want to challenge you, unrepented sin, that signature sin that you think you can't let go of, remember this. Every time you indulge that, you practice that, you eclipse a little more glory of God in your life. You don't want to do that, so don't. This is where the justice of Christ and his love come together. Romans 5, verse 9. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 9. Paul says these words, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him seems like every time I preach, we always talk about the blood. But the writer of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Well, is he talking about animal sacrifices? No, because remember, all animal sacrifices did was point them to the fact that you sinned. I've given you the knowledge of your failure. I haven't taken it away. The blood sacrifice that Paul's referring to here in Romans 5 is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to pause real quick and say this, and I want everybody to pay careful attention. I've read the New Testament. I've studied the blood, what the blood does, how powerful the blood of Christ is. And my friends, I cannot get away from this solitary fact, single fact, that if my sins are to be forgiven... It's only by the blood that was poured out, not spilled, because when you spill something, it's accidental. When you pour something, it's intentional. And Jesus didn't accidentally get on the cross. It was very intentional. It's only through the blood that was poured out on that cross can my sins be forgiven. And I meet the blood of Christ. My sins are washed away, Acts twenty two sixteen, when I am baptized, immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of the sins, Acts two thirty eight, and a host of other passages. Let's not remove the blood and baptism from salvation. The righteousness, the righteous law of God perpetuated on man through his son's supreme sacrifice is seen throughout Scripture. Last but not least, the basis of justification, the meaning of justification, but what are the means of justification? Paul says in Romans 3.28, a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Please note, Paul spent so much of his ministry trying to convince the Jews they didn't have to hold to the customs and traditions of the old law in order to be saved. Now, I don't think anybody walked in here today and still has uh, a, a, you know, affiliation with the Mosaic law. But I will tell you this, there are people even in our midst today and watching online that still believe that a few good works, a few dollars towards a good charity can get them to heaven. James tells us over and over, our works don't save us. It's grace that saves us. And once we're saved, then we get to work. But the works of the old law didn't save people back then and won't save us today. Galatians 2.16, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified not by works, not by my education or my money. No, I'm justified by faith in the only one that matters, and that's Jesus Christ. It all comes back to Jesus 
a just and merciful and righteous king, the guy that I want to emulate, the man that I want to be like, the man that I want to get. Why? Because he gets me. We escape the punishment we deserve, but don't get through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hence, hell serves as God's means of administrating moral justice to those who've rejected grace. Let it not be said of us today that we've heard about it, recognized it, seen the basis for justification, the means of justification, the meaning of justification, and not received it. In Revelation 20, verse 12, John says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in those books. God's nature, folks, will not allow him to accept sinners without having the payment for sin fulfilled in their lives through Christ. God, we talk about the love of God, and we should, and the love of Jesus, and we should, but remember, his justice is not eclipsed by his love. They go hand in hand. And because God is a just God, he cannot look at sin. And if I stand before God on judgment day and I have not received the blood of Christ that covers my sin, then God by his own character and his own nature will not allow me into heaven. Why? Because he doesn't love me? Of course he loves me. There's not a person that's ever lived that God doesn't love. But my only escape from eternal damnation is this. I know your son. I know your son. And your son knows me. A just God will not allow an unrepented sinner into heaven because the justice plays a significant role, as does love. But the good news is you don't have to live another day. without salvation you don't have to live another day without grace you don't have to walk out of here today the same way you came in this morning if you're willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the incarnate son of God full of grace, full of truth that he lived amongst us and died for our sins so that the penalty could be paid for that we could be declared innocent even though guilty of sin. And you're, you're prepared to confess that. You're, you're, you're going to share that audibly. And, and prepared to repent and redirect your worldview and your lifestyle so that it walks hand in hand with a just and loving God. And prepared today to be baptized into Christ so that those sins can be forgiven. I, I only ask this question why would you not respond? And I mean now. Because this is the hour. This is the hour of salvation. God's love and his justice go hand in hand. Grace and love and justice meet at the foot of the cross. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And I truly believe the Spirit's working on your life and working on your heart. Then this is the moment to make Jesus Christ not just your Savior, but your Lord. Trust me, He gets you. But starting today, you can get Him. Let's stand as we sing.
Thank you. Please be seated. You know, every time that we uh, participate in this act of worship that we're about ready to share, we're celebrating the goodness of God. Celebrating, celebrating the goodness of God. Uh, and this year, this month, um, we get to celebrate. We get to celebrate an extra day of life. How good is God? This is leap year. We get an extra day this month. We get an extra day this month to celebrate the goodness of God. We get an extra morning that God's mercies are new that morning. An extra morning to celebrate the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God. An extra morning, an extra day to experience the goodness of a God who loves us unconditionally. Another day to live in the grace and mercy and, and compassion of our loving Heavenly Father. Every time we share in communion and when we come and we give, we're celebrating the goodness of God that He has provided for every need. Provided for every need. And we're going to come back and we're going to honor Him by, by giving part, the, the part of, of our, our possessions that are His. They're not mine to keep. They're His. So I'm going to give them to Him. I'm going to celebrate the goodness of God by honoring Him with my offering today. When we share in communion, we celebrate the goodness of a God who would give His only Son to take away my sins, take away my sins when he went to the cross. You're going to be dismissed row by row. You can bring your offering to the trays. You can collect your communion elements and go back to your seat. Have a time of meditation. Uh, and uh, those of you in the balcony, the offering, uh, the drop boxes for your offering and the communion elements are on the tables as you walk in the doors. I know we have some first-time guests, and, and thank you so much for coming. Let me explain how we do communion. In the communion trays, there are two cups in each slot. Please take both of those. The top cup contains the juice, the bottom cup contains the bread. As we share today, let's celebrate the goodness of God. God who loves us unconditionally, provides for our every need, and provided for our greatest need when he gave his son to die on the cross to take our sins on his shoulders. Let's sing, turn your eyes, as we share in communion today.
We've got some great things going on in the life of the church family. We just want to remind you of some of them. Tonight at 5 o'clock in the fellowship hall is going to be an ordination of new elders and deacons, a, a very special time in the life of our church family that we, uh, that we uh, dedicate uh, these men uh, to this position of leadership and servant leadership in this church family. So know that's going on tonight uh, at 5 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Friday night, family movie night. This is a great time for, for families. Know it's coming up on Friday night. You can see the cost there, 15 bucks. Uh, if you've got any questions, call the church office, ask to speak to Jen Mellenbacher. Men's retreat at Lake Aurora's Friday night, uh, March 1st and Saturday, March the 2nd. Aaron Chambers is coming into town to do that. Wings event that was supposed to take place yesterday has a new date. Uh, it's this coming Saturday, Toho River Boat Adventure. Know that's coming up this coming Saturday. Uh, there's a sign up by the nursery if you're interested in going that. Uh, Rock student event, a scavenger hunt to Disney Springs on Sunday, March the 10th. So, so you can see the information there. If you got any questions, uh, call the church office, ask to speak to Lance or Kelly. They'll tell you everything that's going on. Sunday night, March the 17th, we have the opportunity to host the Grundy Mountain Mission Choir. They are coming th uh, through the state on, on choir tour, and we're, our la we're the last stop. We're their last stop before they head back up to Grundy. So I know that many of you in here know all about Grundy Mountain Mission. It's been around for years, an incredible, incredible thing that God uses in a great way. So we have the opportunity to host their choir, kids' choir. I hope that you will come. You can see the information Sunday night, March the 17th at 6 o'clock. Please don't pass this up. Don't pass this up. They don't get down here very often, so I'm thankful that we can uh, that we that they gave us a call and that we can host them. I know Jim mentioned uh, the new construction there, uh, the soundboard. Everybody, take a look at that as you go back, so you know that it's coming. Uh, we're Osceola County, so in keeping with that, because that's about the size of a postage stamp, we are starting construction of a 500 uh, apartment home complex right back there. Uh, so. <laughs> We're doing our best. <laughs> We're doing our best to fit in with our county. So look at it right there. It'll be done in, in a couple days. All 500 homes will be right back there. So uh, thanks for coming today. Hope you were encouraged in your walk with the Lord. First time guests, thank you so much. Hope that you'll come back and worship with us again. Those of you watching online, thanks. Hope you're encouraged. Let's stand. Continue to be a thousand tongues as we leave today.